Underwriters of the Arizona Mining Review include Mining Foundation of the Southwest, a nonprofit organization based in Tucson, Arizona, working to educate the public about mineral resources and the mineral extraction and processing industries. Amigos, Southwest Buyer's Guide. For almost 40 years, Amigos has worked to provide a better business environment for mining. Pioneer Equipment Incorporated, serving the equipment needs of the mining industry since 1959. And Copper State Bolt and Nut Company, in business since 1972 with 21 branches to serve you. It's August 26, 2015. This is Arizona Mining Review. I'm your host, Lee Allison, here at the Arizona Geologic Survey in Tucson. And starting off the program, as usual, is Niall Nemeth in our office in Phoenix. Niall, welcome back to the show. Glad to be back, Lee. And uh, I know we've got a couple things to cover, but uh, for those of our viewers who have mining claims, I think you had some, some reminders and some, um, some clarification about some information from BLM. So mining claims are due, or the filing fees are due here pretty soon, aren't they? Yeah, people just have a few more days. Your, your okay. filings are due September 1st for either your maintenance fee payment or for your waiver. And I'd like to suggest people, as long as they've got their assessment work done, why don't they go ahead and get their affidavits of labor filed at the same time? Mm, good recommendation. Yeah, yeah, those are due September 1st. Good. So the later. Yeah. One thing I'd like to kind of comment on, and maybe this is just the clientele I've been seeing, uh, it seems like we're going to have a lot more people have their... Ten or less than ten claims so that they can do the waiver. A lot of a lot of people are giving up on the uh, you know the juniors coming in and optioning their property with the lower metal prices. Okay, and that's that's caused a lot of people to ask some questions about how they do that because they've been just making the payment in years past. Ah, okay. So it'll be also interesting to see in a little while what the total number of claims remains yes. at Arizona. Right, because commodity prices changing. Uh costs are going up so we've seen some shifts in the number of claims so we're looking forward to seeing how many mining claims we'll have this year when the, when the numbers total up. Oh, uh, you've got a piece of uh, information about some uh, the, the claim markers that the, the, the information from BLM may be a little bit confusing. Yeah one thing that uh, has changed in uh, Nevada and I don't think it's ever been, or at least for a long time, it's not been legal in California, is the use of PVC pipe as monuments. There's concerns about the loss of birds and, and insects. In Arizona, under our statutes, uh, they're still legal. And so I think it's a good advice to people perhaps to just, you know, get back to using wooden posts, et cetera. But in the literature that the BLM sent out, a copy of here, which we can put up on the screen, uh, they showed examples of just monuments with uh, the post sticking out three feet. And I'd just like to remind everybody that clearly in Arizona, we still have to have a post protruding four feet above the surface. All right. And if you don't, then your mining claim may not be legal. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Great. So Thanks for that. No change to the Arizona monumentation. Just a good idea to probably quit using those PVC posts to avoid yep. having to replace them. In fact, they're encouraging you to, to replace them or change yep. them out. Uh, and this flyer. I don't know how that quite complies with the law because your original location notice states what kind of monuments you used. Okay. So that's that's kind of an unknown. But we all know they tend to disappear over time anyways. Vandals, fires, etc. Yeah. So if you have to re-monument it, you might want to avoid that for future trouble. Okay. Good advice, Niall. Hey, uh, you know, we've been watching the copper price here and it's been uh, dropping down, but... Uh, Apparently not down far enough to, to drive away everybody. Uh, sounds like maybe with the lower prices, somebody, some of the companies are seeing some, some opportunities to come in and, and pick up some bargain basement kind of properties. Uh, what's the word on uh, Johnson Camp, for example? Yeah, last, uh, late last year, Ned Bank uh, put a receiver in place. And what we've seen mid-year today is that a uh, Hong Kong-based group called Passans has uh, made an acquisition there. And uh, the, the bank took a hit, but for uh, a small amount, about $10 million, mm -hmm. and uh, wiping out all the liabilities, uh, we've got a new group, and they're going to operate here in Arizona as Mars Resources. Now, when they were putting this deal together, uh, they were saying that uh, shortly after they could 
close this and, and take uh, control of it, they, they would be looking at reopening and perhaps creating 150 jobs in southern Arizona. Have we heard any update now with the lower copper prices? Are they going to go ahead and, and open up the mine right away, or do you think they may be holding back for a while while they see how, how prices go? You know, I've looked for some news, but I did not contact the company, so that, that still kind of remains an unknown. Maybe we can uh, learn more for a future episode. Okay, so they haven't put out any announcements of, of uh, their plans since the original one saying they thought they could ramp up pretty quickly. No, as near as I can tell, the Passans group is private, and so that always makes it harder to get information. That's why I'll probably need to directly right. contact the company. Okay. Niall, we're, uh, we're running out of time. We've got allocated for this segment. I think you got one more report from uh, up in the Wichita Yeah, we'll just throw one more out on that, on okay. the same theme. Uh, again, you know, people struggle to, to get going on projects, so they become available. We've seen a new group called Cardero Resource Corp., a Canadian junior who's publicly traded, uh, make it. Uh, an acquisition or uh, a lease option agreement on the Zonia mine, which is a copper oxide deposit located between Wickenburg and Prescott. Mm. And the same thing there, they're, they're able to make this acquisition for a couple million dollars plus about 60 million shares over the next few years. So we'll see what kind of progress they can make up on that low grade copper oxide. Okay. Well, I guess the good news is even with prices down, uh, we haven't seen any of the companies talking about layoffs yet or closing operations. So. Uh, we're hoping that uh, it doesn't go any further south and, and jeopardize uh, all of those jobs and all that development. Well, we had those earlier layoffs by ASARCA, but we've had no additional layoffs. Mm. There certainly are rumors floating around, though, of, of potential layoffs coming. Sure. With, with prices dropping like that, it's... it's yeah, just to yeah. establish where we're at this month, we're seeing copper prices as we go to release this at about uh, hitting now below 230 a pound. Mm. But a lot of the companies here in Arizona... I think can operate even below two dollars a pound uh, for a break-even point. You know, one of the other things that we need to keep in mind is fuel is always a big cost component to the mining companies, mm. those shovels, trucks, etc. And so fuel prices are dropping. Right. So a few few breaks on costs. Okay, so that helps mitigate some of those drop in prices. All right, Niall, thanks for joining us again. We'll look forward to talking to you next month, and hopefully prices will be up a little bit then. We'll, we'll hopefully have some better news. That's right. Okay. Thanks, Niall. Well, joining us now is Dr. Gail Heath, a research professor at the Lowell Institute for Mineral Resources at the University of Arizona. And Gail's been working on the monitoring of abandoned and active mines to prevent breaches. And he's joining us here today to talk about the Gold King mine spill. And you have some, some work analyses that you've been doing on that. What's your assessment of what happened? Well, it looks like that uh, they put an unengineered structure to build a dam in the mine workings. Mm -hmm. And that was to stop water from exiting the mine into the river without any kind of reclamation efforts included. Uh, and so the result of that type of situation is that you have a, a strong possibility of that structure failing and all the water inside that mine pool would then exit in an uncontrolled fashion like you saw there in Colorado. Okay. So, so some, we're starting to see some uh, uh, cross sections and some history of the mine. So the Gold King mine itself, the, the, uh, the level where the, the spill occurred, was actually on the side of a mountain and there was quite a, a couple thousand feet, I think, of additional mine workings and other mine activities yes. up above. And so when they were plugging a mine, I understand the Red and Bonita mine somewhere else, that water was building up in, in the shafts and in the tunnels mm -hmm. and moving through the mass of the mountain. And then it kind of blew out right. when they just did a little disturbance. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the efforts in these types of situations have been to build a structure as a dam inside the adit. Mm -hmm. And that's been very common practice in the West for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and it's led to several instances of problems with groundwater contamination and a few uh, ex uncontrolled exits through these mine openings, through the place where the dam was, or in unknown areas that seepage has started to occur through, through other old workings that were not accounted for. Okay. So what's the solution? How do you get around this problem? Well, the solution is to add a few things to this type of 
of remediation effort. So the best thing to do is have a secure, good, engineered barrier or dam inside the mine. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have a good understanding of all the attached workings. So if there's any others exposed to the surface, you do know about those. Uh, the next thing you should have is a controlled access point for fluid to come out of the mine so you can control when it's coming out and how much. Okay. And outside the mine you should have a wetlands there to catch the runoff water. That'll help purify the water somewhat. And inside the mine you need to have some kind of uh, real-time automated monitoring system to understand the water quality and the distribution of the fluid in the, in the ground. And so that means you should be able to understand where the fluid is and where it's going at all times inside your mountain. Okay. And on top of that, you need to have access to the underground workings from the surface through a borehole or a drill hole, something like that, where you can put amendments such as uh, uh, food for the bacteria and monitor the quality and quantity of the bacteria and how they're doing. And once you have a good, happy bacterial uh, colony inside this mine pool, the bacteria will actually take the contaminated water and uh, run the chemistries in such a fashion that you'll get uh, the metals that are dissolved in the water to precipitate out or come out of solution as metal sulfides. And those metal sulfides are stable underwater. Okay. And so these bacteria in most cases will uh, will take care of the water to a point that it's actually discharge quality according to EPA regulations. Okay. And so you want to control the outflow of the water so once the water is purified you can let that purified water out, put it through that marsh at the, at the mouth of the mine and that will additionally uh, purify any contaminants that are still left in the water and then you can freely release that water into the environment with no environmental issues. Wow. So, a comprehensive system, so if I understand right, then the bacteria would pull the metals out of the water inside the mine workings That's behind correct. this dam, yep. and it would precipitate out, it would fall under the water there inside the mining uh, system and stay within the mountain. That's correct. Anything that might be released or would seep out, you would create an artificial wetlands or marsh out in front of it and run it through there. Yes. And that should be enough then that whatever comes out of the marsh is basically good, clean, pure mountain water. That's correct. In almost all cases, that's the case. And one other, uh, one other big advantage to a system like this is that the mine workings that are open, such as the tunnels or adits or stopes, actually fill up with metal sulfides. And so that in reality, you're uh, recycling all the ores in the mountain, reconcentrating them in an area that you can remine again in the future. Oh, now that's interesting. So it, okay. it actually has several advantages. The cost effectiveness of this treatment is much better than anything else. And then in the long term, you get, uh, you get a good or great body that you could actually remine again in the future. Okay, that was a question I was going to ask you. Is this more expensive, but you're saying it's less expensive or it's more efficient than the current kind of super fun cleanups where it's massive engineering? Yeah, currently, if they don't dam... Uh, the underground workings, usually what they do is treat the water with a ion replacement water treatment system, and that's mm -hmm. very, very expensive and very inefficient. Mm -hmm. So if you use the in-situ bioremediation efforts underground, then you gain all the advantages of nature, and you're not fighting against nature, and it's by far the most cost-effective method. Okay. Are there examples where this has worked that you can point to? Uh, there is a mine in Colorado called Captain Jack, Mm -hmm. which is just up on the mountain from Boulder, Colorado. They are currently trying this, and I think that they've just not quite far enough to prove that, this, that the system as a whole works, but pieces and parts have been tried in open pit mines for remediation of pit lakes, mm -hmm. and that has worked extremely well. And all the, all the features we talked about for underground workings are the same as the, what was done in pit lakes. Okay. And there's several pit lakes like Bearwright Hill in South Carolina that was done to great success. And a few tests in, North, in South Dakota and the Black Hills to some pretty good success. Okay. So is there, uh, what would be the biggest risk at, at trying this if they went back in, say, to the, the Gold King mine or that complex that they were working on? Is there anything different or unusual there that you're aware of 
that would present a challenge that might be different from where it's been tested so far? No, I think if you look at the system as a whole and have all the aspects that we need in there, like monitoring, make sure you understand the hydrology, where the water's going, mm -hmm. the behavior of the water, make sure that the bacterial colonies in situ are happy okay, and working and doing what you need them to do. And it's really important to have that outlet so you can control the water in the system. So you can, can take water out as needed if it starts to get into areas that might overflow in other, uh, out of other mine okay. workings, you can take that water out that's been treated and release that into the environment. Okay, one of the things we've started hearing about the Gold King mine disaster was that um, the mountain had been filling up with water, basically. Yes. As they blocked off these various adits, there was the water naturally moving through the system, but there was new water coming in. And when they started blocking up one of the natural, or not natural, but one of the tunnels, that water was building up, and so it blew out, or it was about to blow out the tunnel there at Gold King Mine, and so as soon as they just started doing a little bit of work, it was enough to break through. Yes. So can you build dams? Big, well, I guess what you're saying is you build the inside dams, but you have an outlet so Correct. that if pressure gets up to a certain amount or it starts ready to spill out somewhere, that you're not prepared that, for, yeah. you've got a drain that you can let that pressure off and that's, bring the water out. That's correct. So it's really important to be able to control what's going on in the subsurface with the water. Right. And with the, if you have a happy bacterial colony going on and a good monitoring system attached with that, you'll know exactly what's going on in the system and be able to extract water out as needed or, you know, uh, to keep everything at a certain level so it doesn't overflow in other areas. So, okay. yes. How do you keep the bacteria happy? Well, you typically, it depends a little bit on the ore body, mm -hmm. uh, how acidic the water becomes. Uh, you know, as pyrite or metal sulfides oxidize, they rust, and that rusting process produces sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. And then that sulfuric acid will actually dissolve other metals in, in the rocks. And so that's one thing that's such an environmental hazard is acid full of uh, metals yeah and so the bacteria can live in a certain ph range and so if that water be is below that ph range you need to buffer the water or raise the ph okay and then you need to feed the bacteria to make uh, to make them happy so they'll grow and, and uh, prosper and and work for you and typically it's short chain carbon, so you feed them like alcohols or molasses, something like that. Okay, alcohol. So we're going to have yeah. a bunch of drunk bacteria That's right. cleaning up our water <laughs> in all of these mines. Yes, then they'll be happy. Right? Then they'll be happy. Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I've never heard this idea that, uh, that the bioremediation will concentrate the ores back again. It does. So in that case, I would suspect that they're, they're going to be in the water, in the mine shafts, and they're going to be precipitating out so that you're basically just scooping up stuff off the floor of the old tunnels. Well, what will happen is you're not going back in there while that's flooded and while this yeah. remediation effort is ongoing, and that will be ongoing for a substantial period of time. Uh, and so in reality what will happen is these voids or open spaces underground will be filled with these metal precipitates. Ah, I see. And so okay. these will self-seal in time. Right. Okay, so it's not just coming out of suspension, they're actually precipitating and forming kind of a, uh, rebuilding the mountain, That's rebuilding correct. the ore body. Yes. Fascinating. Okay, well, this is really exciting. Uh, and I think with all of the concerns we're hearing about, uh, you know, other abandoned mines and other, other potential problems across the country, that there's going to be a lot more attention turned to what can we do to clean this up. So I think your plan here sounds like it's, it's the solution everybody may be turning to. Well, I like it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Gail, thank you so much for joining us. But maybe, was there anything that, that you didn't bring I think, up? That, I think we got it covered pretty well. Okay. That's great. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Well, joining us now is John Lacey, a professor of practice at the University of Arizona, who is the new director of the Global Mining Law Center. John's also an attorney with DeConcini, McDonald, Yetwin, and Lacey uh, here in Tucson. John, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. And we want to talk about this new Global Mining Law Center at the University of Arizona. It's part of the James Rogers College of Law. But what is it? 
Well, it's, uh, it's a combined program where we have two uh, advanced degrees. Okay. Uh, and it is designed for both uh, graduate lawyers and uh, advanced and, and graduate uh, mining engineers and uh, geologists. Uh, the idea is to create a master's, either a master's of law or what's called a master of legal studies. Uh, it is a 30 unit curriculum uh, and uh, the, uh, the idea is to combine both the uh, uh, issues of law with, with uh, uh, technical issues. So in essence what we're doing okay. is, is training lawyers to know what's going on in the uh, natural resources field uh, uh, and the mining field and training uh, mining engineers, uh, uh, you know, the interpretations of law. Essentially we have the same curriculum uh, uh, for, for both, both groups. Uh, except for the fact we start out with uh, uh, some programs of uh, teaching law for dummies okay. <laughs> uh, to educate the, the engineers and uh, uh, geology for dummies uh, to, to educate the lawyers. Uh, so, and, uh, but after that they follow essentially the same program. There are alternatives uh, within, within the program directed to uh, either domestic or international. Oh. Okay. Uh, and so the the idea is that's that's where the global fits in, okay. uh, because we we really do want to attract uh, international students. Okay, so um, why do this now, and why do this at the University of Arizona? Well, I think that this is something that uh, 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 that has been needed for a long time. Uh, the uh, when when I was in law school. Uh, it was a time when my dad was uh, chair of the Department of Mining and Geological Engineering. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, he came over, and uh, uh, he and Bill Peters came over and uh, taught our uh, our mining law course. And uh, I think that dad's uh, ultimate goal was to, uh, as as a uh, mining and geological engineer, the professor there, his his ultimate goal was to educate lawyers. And uh, so I think he sent me out as a missionary, right. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is the, the ultimate yeah. result of that. Uh, but I think that the need has been, been growing over the years. Typically, uh, uh, law firms that, that represent mining clients uh, wind up uh, you know, educating on the job, training for, uh, okay. uh, for their own folks. And the same thing with, uh, uh, with mining executives. I mean, there really is a great lead time, and we felt that, that we could uh, fill this need. Uh, the, as to the question of why, why Arizona, uh, well, I think that the answer to that question probably is, is focused on the, uh, uh, the Lowell Institute for Mineral Resources. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the Lowell Institute is, is just a, a magnificent uh, project. Uh, headed by uh, Dr. Mary Poulton. Uh, uh, Mary has uh, been uh, coming in to give, give lectures to my classes in mining law. I've, I've taught the, the course in mining law at, at the uh, university for 40 years now. And uh, uh, I, I used dad un, until he was 90 years old, and, <laughs> and at which point uh, 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 I, I've been relying on Mary. But the, the program uh, and connections of the Lowell Institute, uh, I, I think that, that provide the, uh, uh, the breadth of knowledge that uh, is really a critical part of this program. Okay, and Mary's now uh, still the head of the Lowell Institute, but is now part of this new Global Mining Center. Yes, Mary, Mary has, a, in, in addition to her appointments at, yes. the, uh, <laughs> at uh, Public Health, uh, she also has an appointment in, in law. And she, te she teaches the introduction and is part of a, a lot of the planning process and in, in, uh, arranging for uh, some of the short courses that uh, have, have historically been taught at uh, the Lowell Institute. We are uh, re reworking some of those uh, to teach them at, uh, 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 as part of the program. Okay. 
Now, it's not just the two of you who are bringing your dad in. It's, uh, <laughs> well, the, well, if only dad could come in, you know. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. but the Rogers College of Law is actually a, a very large program with a real diversity of expertise. Yes, we, uh, w within the, the law school faculty, uh, we, we are really well known in, in many areas of uh, uh, indigenous people, uh, the, uh, uh, the Native American law there, water law program, uh, environmental law. Uh, I think that the, uh, there is a, a breadth of, of talent that's there that, that we are certainly tapping into. Uh, the, uh, the t on, the, on the technical side, that's when we're, uh, we're bringing in folks with extensive experience in uh, uh, things like sustainable development uh, and uh, the, uh, well, valuation of mineral properties, uh, things, things like that where you, you bring in people with, with a lot of direct experience and uh, have them uh, teach the classes. Now, a lot of those classes are going to be set up as online classes. Oh. Uh, and okay. uh, so it's, and, and really the whole, the whole project is designed to uh, include people that are both residents, uh, you know, your traditional students and residents. Uh, then we're doing uh, short courses that, uh, okay. uh, and most of our short courses are either one or two units. And, and for those, we'll probably, for example, teach those on uh, Friday afternoons and Saturday mornings, so that uh, okay. if where people are working, that they can, uh, it's conceivable for them to get off work and uh, uh, attend the classes. Uh, for a for a one unit class uh, that requires uh, 14 hours of instruction, which means that we're we're dealing with uh, uh, successive uh, weekends mm -hmm. uh, to teach that. And of course, we you know have to. We, we can make accommodations with that, you know, that we need to avoid basketball games right. and, okay. uh, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, and considerations like right. that. Uh, but then for the, uh, uh, for the online courses, uh, those are being set up. Uh, we have uh, made arrangements uh, for a studio over at the College of Education that, that is really state of the art and we're, we're really imp impressed with that. Uh, and so those those courses will be uh, available online, but you know even for the courses that we're teaching in residence, uh, the uh, we're going to try to uh, for all of those to do a video capture. So it it would be conceivable for people that, that can't be there all the time uh, to be able to watch the video capture. Now, you know that that's not the best of of uh, a learning situation, but at least. Uh, it's not critical that you're there all the time. Ultimately, I think that we'd like to be able to offer this thing entirely online. Interesting, because uh, the program now, the full-time program, is about a one-year program. And, and it's yeah, it's 30 units. Okay. And uh, uh, you know, which of course is would be 15 units a semester. Uh, the uh, the thinking is of something if someone is working full time, that uh, uh, that they probably can't take more than. You know, uh, you know, four or five units uh, mm -hmm. uh, during okay. during that time. Okay. But I think that the uh, the idea that we can have the materials available uh, uh, online or as part, part of a video capture, I, I think that that gives people a lot more flexibility for that. Okay. Well, it sounds like the University of Arizona is particularly well suited between the law school and the mining and engineering, mining and geologic engineering capabilities. So designing it so that you can reach out beyond the Tucson market yes. worldwide, it sounds like. Yes, we're, I think that that's one thing that makes us very different uh, than, than other institutions that have similar uh, graduate programs. Um, I think that the, the physical proximity between the law school and, and the mines building I walked it the other day. It took me three minutes okay. uh, to get between right. them. And some of the some of the courses are taught, or have have traditionally been taught over at uh, uh, at the mines okay. building. Uh, so, and uh, uh, like I say, the uh, the proximity of uh, uh, Dr. Poulton's office and uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, folks at the at the law school. I think it makes makes that uh, really an ideal situation. Okay. Um, so what's the status of the program now? I know it's it's uh, starting in August, like right yeah, now. Yeah, we've we're, we're starting our first class is I, I think it's August twenty fourth, uh, and uh, uh, that will be in uh, in in my mining law, uh, mining and public land law course that, that is on the domestic side. Uh, the uh, I'm being assisted uh, this year by uh, Professor James Hopkins, who uh, has a great deal of expertise in uh, uh, indigenous peoples and uh, uh, Native Americans. Uh, and uh, so I think that that, uh, that, that adds a, a new dimension to my uh, domestic law course. But the, that particular course is, is essentially dealing with mineral tenure. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the mining, the, the sort of the, the traditional core mining law, uh, right. mining claims, other uh, mineral rights. But then, you know, that, that's always sort of been the, uh, the initial starting point, and, and usually one of the few classes that are, uh, that are really taught uh, in, uh, in law schools. Uh, so far as I can tell, the University of Arizona has offered uh, a, a course in mining law since at least 1925. Wow. Uh, okay. And uh, uh, so we're, we have a long tradition of doing it. But to, to be able to expand uh, at this point to cover all yeah. the, the other areas, I think, is critical. One thing I didn't mention when I introduced you is that uh, you've got a long history of publishing uh, about the history of mining law, and was the, you were the uh, president of the Arizona Historical Society previously. So, and, and you, you inferred this or said something about it a couple minutes ago, mining law has really changed from what it was say, in 1920s or even earlier, and what the core issues are. And we're now dealing with sustainability, environmental justice, indigenous peoples, uh, environmental impacts. The breadth of what's now dealt with by mining law is just yes, it's, exploding. Well, it, it has been uh, ex expanded uh, uh, significantly, during, particularly since the 1970s with, with the passage of the uh, National Environmental Policy Act. Uh, but when you get back to the the mineral tenure system, uh, uh, right now we're we're still talking about the mining law of 1872, yes. uh, and that is creates the basic the basis of uh, a great deal of the mineral rights themselves, of uh, your patented mining claims. Uh, you know, even though we have claims that uh, uh, are being mined today, you, they, they still go back to the basic patent that may have been issued in as far back as the 1860s or 1870s. Okay. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's important to know what, what rights go with, with those claims uh, to understand the, the tenure itself. Now, the, uh, the, the expansion of mining law has is, is really been on the environmental side. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the issues of both understanding the, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples and understanding their concerns. Uh, is, is, and these, these are issues that the people uh, really are required to know in order to get mines into operation. We're seeing that worldwide. That's increasingly yeah. where, the, where, where so much effort is being needed yes. to, to get a mine going. Well, this sounds like an incredible opportunity. Um, you said there are a few other programs that you're aware of. Um, uh, how does how does your program compare to others uh, around the country, around the world, in terms of its scope or uh, uh, focus? You know, I think I think that some of the other programs that are available at the, at the graduate level uh, frequently have associations with other mining schools. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that, as far as I know, that we are the only one that has such a, a, a close uh, physical, both a physical yes. presence as well as the, the close use of the uh, instructors and professors of that, of that other school. Right. Uh, within, I, I, th I think in Europe, for example, uh, there's, there's very little coverage of, uh, of, of this sort. 
uh, we've been looking and looking around right. and really haven't seen anything that uh, uh, that compares to what we're trying to put together. Okay. Well, congratulations. Uh, it's an exciting new concept, and we're, we're excited to see it take off here in, in Arizona, and, and, uh, and it sounds like an incredible opportunity for uh, people locally and now worldwide to really bring the, the science and the law together. So. Yeah, I think that, you know, over the years, uh, I can honestly say that, uh, that most of my education has come from my clients. Okay. Uh, and uh, so I think that this, this is an opportunity to, uh, 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 to sort of collapse that, uh, uh, that educational curve and to uh, try to turn out both lawyers and engineers that are capable of hitting the ground running. Uh, and uh, assist the ultimately assist the uh, the industry uh, in that way. That, that's a really good point. As that I I found a lot of my own learning experience was being in the classroom or being working with my colleagues and learning from each other and working together. Yes. Mm -hmm. So getting the lawyers and the geologists and the engineers sitting in the same classes yes. and bringing different perspectives and understanding challenging it from different views yes. could be tremendously exciting. Yeah, my, my mining law class has, has always been open to, uh, uh, to graduate uh, mining engineers and, and geologists, okay, the occasional undergraduate. Uh, but I've, I've always found that uh, uh, having those uh, students in the classroom uh, adds, adds a real uh, effective dimension to, to the class. Great. John, thank you so much for joining us. Was there anything that I've missed that uh, you wanted to... You know, I, th I think we've, we've pretty well, <laughs> well covered it. I, I you know, I think that the critical thing to, to take away is the understanding that, that what we're really dealing with is, is a flexible program. And I, I think that, that we, we want to have it set up so that it appeals to both people that are coming, coming uh, uh, to the program uh, both uh, as, as traditional students and uh, ultimately uh, what's, what, what will probably be uh, an online uh, yeah. instruction. And, you know, there, there's a considerable learning curve as to how we do those yes. things online. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking that, that a lot of those courses, I want to have them set up as, uh, uh, as interviews. Uh, because that, you know, people are accustomed these days to getting their, their news with right. the reporter interviewing uh, uh, someone that, that yeah. is, is knowledgeable about the subject. And I, and I think sort of the give and play or give and take of that type of presentation uh, may, may result in, in uh, a more effective teaching tool, but we'll see. Okay. Well, it sounds like a great experiment. Again, thanks for joining us, Jim. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me.